And today we want to continue with the electrons and uh, where to find them in the atom. And so I'll go to chapter number nine because these two chapters are linked. We have talked about the atom, the atomic structure. And now we know the subatomic particle, the electron. And now we want to go a little bit more in uh, more detail. We want to go into uh, details on um, the arrangement of the electrons in the atom. So in chapter nine, as you can see on the screen, it is titled Electronic Structure and Periodic Trends. If you were careful and you were reading chapter four, you will see those periodic trends at the end of chapter four. And uh, they would come back in chapter nine as well. So let's talk about electronic structure and the periodic trend. But before then, we want to get the, some information behind what we are going to do. Uh, the first thing that we usually want to know is the following questions we want to address. If you look at the periodic table and you start looking at the elements and how they react, you would find that helium in group number 8A, group number 8A, you see group number 8A is made up of the element helium neon, argon, so that is helium, a neon, argon, and krypton, xenon, and then you have radon, okay. Those are group number 8A. If you look at the first element, helium, you would see that it's inert. All these are inert. Uh, they are classified as inert elements. So what is it about these atoms? And uh, if we want to ask ourselves, what is it about helium atoms that makes helium gas inert? That's the question we have to answer in this chapter. Uh, in contrast, when you look at hydrogen gas, Hydrogen is so reactive. The hydrogen atom itself is reactive. So why is hydrogen reactive? Why is hydrogen reactive? And why is helium inert? The third question that we have to answer from this chapter is, hydrogen exists as a diatomic element. Why does it exist as a diatomic element? And um, in light of what we have said, the three questions uh, as to why some elements exist as uh, diatomics, others are very active, and others are not so reactive. So hydrogen atoms are so reactive that if they react with each other, they form hydrogen molecules. In other words, they form diatomic, the diatomic, it's a diatomic molecule. What is it then about hydrogen atoms that makes them so reactive? we would have to answer these questions. And the answer is in the electrons themselves. The answer you get it from how the electrons are arranged in the atom. So let's talk about the electrons in atoms and at the periodic table. Now we want to examine two models that have been given to us from the very first, from early on. We examined the Bohr model and the quantum mechanical model that will try to answer the question that we have asked ourselves. So then, um, those two models propose explanations for the inertness of uh, helium, the reactivity of hydrogen, and the periodic law. So these two models, they explain how electrons exist in atoms and how those electrons affect the chemical and physical properties of elements. So remember the two models that we want to talk about here is the Bohr model and the quantum mechanical model. Those are two models we want to look at to give us some explanations on the reactivity of the atoms. So the first one, the 
as we look at these models, let's look at uh, the historical uh, underpinnings. We want to look at Niels Bohr and uh, Erwin Schrodinger. We want to look at uh, Niels Bohr and uh, Erwin uh, Schrodinger, who gave us some of these explanations. These are some uh, early scientists. So Erwin, uh, you can see Niels Bohr here, the Dutch scientist, and Erwin Schrodinger, the German scientist. At the beginning of the last century, they offered some explanations on why some of these atoms exist the way they do. Along with other scientists like uh, Albert uh, Einstein, they played a role in the development of uh, quantum mechanics. I'm going to explain what that entails because something there is something new here that uh, many of us have not encountered before. So they looked at uh, the arrangement of the electrons and they came up with uh, what we call quanta, quantum mechanics. So they were bewildered by their own theory. They just uh, came up with a theory uh, from uh, some mathematical explanations. Uh, the, their theory of wave particle duality of the electron, that the electron has, can behave as a wave, it can also behave as a particle. It has those two properties, right? And so their explanations is based on how light, the electromagnetic radiation, how it interacts with the atoms. So the interaction of light with atoms helped to shape the scientists' models of the atom. And so light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, as we know, and light is a type of energy. It travels through space and through a vacuum at a constant speed of 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. You can convert that to miles. It's going to be 186,000 miles per second. So light can exist or it can be treated as a wave, can be treated as a particle itself. And so light has properties of both waves and particles. That's what we mean by the wave particle duality of light. So here is a Ball's model. Ball's, Ball developed a simple model to explain the results of light as a wave and light as a particle. So remember what this is all about. We are trying to explain the behavior of the atoms that we see. Some of them are reactive and some of them are not reactive. Here is the ball model. So at the center here, we know the nucleus and there are seven shells. There is shell number one with uh, labeled as N equals one. Shell number two, that is uh, n equals to two. You have a shell number three, n equals to three, shell number four, n equals to four. And electrons orbit around each of these shells, depending on how many electrons the atom has. So this is what we call shells or orbits. So this is the ball model. So the ball model tells us that atoms molecules can only exist in certain states characterized by definite amounts of energy. And when an atom or a molecule changes its state, remember we're talking about atoms and molecules, they can exist only in certain states uh, characterized by definite amounts of energy. This is the term quantum, quantum theory. Quanta means a packet of the quantum theory. So we are talking about the atoms and molecules existing in certain states, which are characterized by a definite amount of energy. And so when an atom or a molecule changes its state, it can move from one level to another, it can absorb energy or emit an amount of energy. Emit an amount of energy, electromagnetic radiation, it is just that amount of energy it's going to absorb is sufficient to bring it to another state. It's quantum. This is an interesting, an interesting information that you would uh, live with if uh, you care to see what it means and how we perceive light currently. And this is information that, it, that is used in science to arrive 
that some studies, for example, the molecules and atoms. So don't forget, there is absorption. There is absorption of light. Absorption of light brings an atom to a given state. And notice in the next here, so we can have what we call some electronic energy. The form of energy that arises from the motion of an electron about, about the nucleus and from the interactions among the electron and between the electrons and the nucleus. So the electron, if it's at the first energy level, shell number one, it can move to another state, energy level n equals to two. So only certain values of the electronic energy are allowed for an atom. So this is what we call quantum. It must have a definite quantified amount of energy, a defined amount of energy to move it from one state to another. And so we say this packet of energy is what we call quantized energy. And so a change of electronic energy level or a state of an atom involves absorption, if it absorbs, or if it gives up that energy, if it's in a higher state, then gives up the energy. It emits that energy of a definite amount or what we call a quantum of energy. Quantum of energy. This is a word now we adopt in our everyday lives the quantum of energy. So the lowest electronic energy state with an electron in the lowest energy state, that is what we call the ground state. And uh, any state with uh, energy greater than that of the ground state is what we call the excited state, the ground state and the excited state. So we have given some of these terms. We have given quantum amount of energy, we are talking about absorption, absorption, taking in an amount of energy and the electron gets, uh, it's lifted up to a higher energy. And if it can give up that amount of energy, then we, it emits that energy. It's what we use in everyday life in studying science. And so we are giving some of these explanations. We are trying to build these explanations as why a hydrogen atom, notice a hydrogen atom, or the stability of the hydrogen atom and the stability of the helium atom. So further, this first of the, some of this information that we are looking at, have come a long way. Bohr, Bohr, uh, Niels Bohr, the gentleman I showed you earlier on, you want to see the person again? You see here, Niels Bohr came up with these ideas and uh, Erwin Schrodinger also came up with uh, these ideas and they were astounded by their implications. So here is what we are saying then. We're just saying that Bohr developed a model of the arrangement of electrons around the nucleus. So arrangement of electrons around the nucleus with the following assumptions. So they came up with some results and then they developed some model. And uh, they say that electrons move around the nucleus in shells or in orbits. That is the first statement that Bohr made. Bohr also said electrons are arranged in discrete levels or shells and they have discrete energy levels. If you notice what I'm saying here is I have repeated this statement. It's saying that an electron can have um, a given amount of energy, discrete amounts of energy, what we call want a packet of energy. And so the shells, so if, if, if an electron is in the ground state, the lowest energy, it can move to the second energy level. You have to give it some amount of energy to do so. It has to be a certain amount of energy. It has to move, the shells have fixed energy values and each shell has a different amount of energy. And the lowest energy level is closest to the nucleus. The shells farthest from the nucleus have higher energies. 
So we are using the word shells and orbits uh, synonymously. So in this diagram here, you can see a depiction of what this means. Notice n equals to one, the first shell here. And this electron is n equals to one. You can see the nucleus. There is some interaction between the electron and the nucleus. But let's say the electron is in the first inner level as depicted here in the diagram. If it gets a given amount of energy, you can move it from energy level number one to n equals to three. So the first step here, if you have energy input, the first step of the electron moving from n equals one to n equals to three is what we call absorption, absorption. That is that a process where the, in, the, it can move from n equals one to n equals to two, n equals to two to n equals to three. And remember, there are seven shells. This diagram is only showing three shells for our understanding. If that electron, as you see it again, right here on the third energy level, if it reverts back to the first energy level, then we call that emission, as you see here, light is emitted. So those are the processes. So what did Bohr say? That electrons move in energy levels, decrete, discrete shells. And each energy level is associated with a certain amount of energy. The shell closest to the nucleus, in our case, n equals to one, has the lowest amount of energy. And the shell farthest from the nucleus, whether it's n equals to three, n equals to four, n equals to five, as long as they are farthest from the nucleus, then we are saying here that uh, they have higher energy levels. And these are the statements of uh, Niels Bohr. He said, for you to move an electron from n equals to one to n equals to three, you need a quantity of energy, a quanta of energy. And so depicted here is the diagram showing you the energy levels. So n equals to one, not easier, energy, absorption. The electron is the first energy level. It can move to the second energy level, n equals to two. And you can see increasing energy from 2.17, eight times 10 to the minus 18 joules to 5.445 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now, you want to see the lowest energy level. It has the lowest energy. And you see the gaps between n equals to one to n equals to two. And the gap between n equals to two, n equals to three. They keep decreasing. The uh, energy differences keep decreasing. And this diagram and this pictorial diagram here are trying to show us the same information. In the first one, we are saying that electrons can move uh, from one energy level to another when they absorb a certain amount of energy. And they can go back to the ground state or to a lower energy state by emitting a certain amount of energy. This is what you see in these arrows shown in blue here, all right? And so the electrons at a high energy levels can move back to the lowest energy level. And that's what we call emission. They emit a certain amount of energy. So this is, uh, we can give an analogy to the rungs, to the rungs in a ladder. Okay. So this, as you see here, the lowest, if you are at the ground state, the lower rung, you, know, you are at n equals to one. And then you move to the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one. The farther you are from the ground state, from the ground, then you should be uh, having more energy. So you are farther away from the ground state. All right? All right. So this is another, another depiction, another diagram to explain what we have been talking about. So this is Bohr's model. I've given you Bohr's model. 
And so all these was captured in what we call the quantum mechanical model. So the first thing in uh, when quantum mechanics was developed, quantum mechanics, when we are saying that uh, there is a certain quanta of energy, this revolutionized physics and chemistry because in the quantum mechanics, electrons do not behave like particles flying through space. Electrons behave like waves. The, remember we talked about the wave particle duality. The electrons do not behave like particles flying in space, through space. We cannot in general describe their exact parts. So now this is the quantum part. Remember Bohr gave us the theory, very early theory, which is going to be modified later. And so um, in this model then, this model with details, then the electrons move from one energy level to another with the exact paths. And an orbital is a probability map that shows where the electron is likely, not is the word, is likely to be found. That is a probability. That word is associated with probability. An orbital is a probability map where you are likely to find the electron when the atom is probed. It does not represent the exact path. You don't know where you will find it. It does not represent the exact path that an electron takes as it travels through space. So, but an orbital is really a region in space where you are likely to find the electron. I'm using another word there a region in space where you are likely to find the electron. Okay, so we have said this so far about the quantum mechanical model. So we, in the quantum mechanical model, a number, and I let us specify an orbital. Remember we have said an orbital, an orbital, is a region in space, in space where you are likely, it's a probability, where you are likely to find an electron. It is a probability map. So, but it's going to be found in a certain region in space. So how do you describe this electron in space? So we use certain numbers to describe the region in space. We use four numbers to specify, four letters to specify an orbital or orbitals. The lowest energy orbital in the quantum mechanical model is called the S orbital. Remember, an orbital is a region in space. The, it's specified by the number one, one telling you it's the lowest energy level, and the letter S is that space where that electron is uh, likely to be found. And the number is called the principal quantum number. Now, I know this is something new that many of us don't know about. So let me again try to explain this in uh, the quantum mechanical theory. I want to, before I move on to the next thing, I want us in an atom, in an atom, electrons are arranged as follows. Remember the Bohr model arranged as follows. The Bohr model was just telling us that the electrons just move on the racetrack in lines. But the quantum mechan mechanical model put details into that model. In other words, Bohr model was not good enough. The quantum mechanical model needed to put more details. And these are now the details in the quantum mechanical model. So in an atom then, in an atom, electrons are arranged as follows. It has the shells and the shells are n equals to one, two, three, four, five, six, 
and 7. And n, n is defined as the principal quantum number. All right. So I want us to understand what we are talking about. Notice that in an atom, an atom is very small, as we say, it has electrons. The electrons are orbiting around the nucleus. And we now want to describe these electrons as they move around the nucleus. And from what we know, the, these electrons can be found in, a, in a, any one of the seven energy levels that we know of. It can be found in level number one, level number two, level number three, and so on. This is how I describe the atom myself. If you take an onion, for example, you take an onion, the bulb, and you're going to see, if you slice it, you're going to see layers. And those are the shells that is related to the shells. And so that is what I want. That's what I want to uh, look at right, uh, right now, okay? And so shells, and then from the shells, we have the sub shells. So if it is an onion, you have the shells. All right, it seems everybody said Zoom is fine. That's same. all right. Okay, so we have the shells, like the onions and the layers, and within the layers, we can have the sub shells. Let's use that as, right? That must be the sub shells. And the sub shells, Remember, the shells are the energy levels. I'm using the analogy of the onion. And the subshells, usually you have one or more per shell. And this, we have types of subshells that we're going to talk about. And the types of subshells are, are labeled as S, P, D, F, you can go to G, so H and so on. But this is what we are going to talk about. These are the types of subshells. Then the subshells, remember, Ball's model was not good enough. Quantum mechanics tried to put more details into the Ball's model. The Ball's model viewed the atom or electrons moving around the atoms in a racetrack. But now, where do you find that electron? We don't know where it is. So we have to use these numbers to tell us where the electron is. So you have the shells, energy levels, and within each energy level, you have a subshell. And I keep coming to uh, my onion analogy. You have an onion, and it has layers, and within each one of the layers, you have sub-layers. So you're going to find the electron in those subshells. First, you define the electron as being found in a given layer, and then you have a sublayer, all right? Or in this case, we have subshells, and within subshells, within the shell, we have subshells. And subshells can further that space where you would likely find the electron is what we call the orbital. And then there is one or more, more orbital per subshell. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the, the, the orbitals are also labeled to as S, P, D, F, and so on. Here is an important statement that we need to know. Each, each orbital 
contains two electrons with op opposite spins. So those spins will be an up or a down spin. All right, I've given a summary of the quantum mechanical model that has put details into the Bohr model. And now, I now want to go into these details here, having given this explanation here. Okay. And I hope this helps uh, us understand a little bit better on uh, the arrangement of the electrons. The details, these are some of the details that some of us may not have seen. And I would encourage you, you can go online and see some of these explanations. All right? So then you can see the energy levels, n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, five, six, and seven is an increase in energy as you see. The higher the principal quantum number, so, so we have called this the lowest, those energy levels are the principal quantum number n and it specifies the principal shell of the orbital. The energy increases with the principal quantum number as you see here in this diagram. And so the higher the principal quantum number, the higher the energy of the orbital. So each orbital is going to be found in n equals to one, n equals to two, n equals to three, n equals to four. And uh, there will be subshell. The possible principal quantum numbers, as you see in this diagram, will be n equals to one, n equals to two, three, all the way to seven, with energy increasing as n increases. Now, the first energy level, n equals to one, it is only going to have one orbital or where the electron moves in that energy level, it describes it in shape, what we call the S orbital. The one S orbital, one, energy level number one, S is that orbital and S orbital has the lowest possible principal quantum number. It is in the lowest inner shell and it has the lowest possible energy. So the at level energy level number one, you only have one orbital. So the letter indicates the subshell of the orbital and it's going to specify the shape, one S. And then the possible letters as I've given you, I've summarized it, is the possible letters are of the, remember this, the, the, the shell of the energy level and then the subshell. The possible letters of the subshell are S, P, D, and F, each with a different shape. So these subshells, if you use the onion, they have different shapes as well. And orbitals within, remember orbitals are within the subshell, orbitals within the S subshell have a spherical shape. And some of these things come from uh, mathematical uh, calculations here. So these are mathematical uh, findings. So we have the shells. You want to see here the number of shells in a given principal shell is equal to the value of n. You have these questions in um, the uh, homework, in the homework itself. The homework for chapter number nine is upcoming. So n equals to one, n equals to two, n equals to three, and n equals to four. Notice there, you have the number of subshells, one, n equals to one, it has only one subshell. n equals to two, it has two subshells. n equals to three, three subshells. And n equals to four, four subshells. What are those subshells? For n equals to one, it has a one subshell, and it has, notice the letters specifying the subshells, S, so there is S subshell in each of, in all the energy levels. 
And again, we have the energy level number one as subshell. And n equals to two has two subshells, S and P, two of them. And then you have n equals to three, S, P, and D. I made an important statement that you're going to see. An orbital can only be occupied with two electrons, with an up spin or a down spin. Now, so you can see these subshells here, n equals to one, one subshell, n equals two, two subshells, n equals to three, three subshells, S, P, D, and n equals to four, S, P, D, and F, n equals to five, S, P, D, F, and G, and so on. All right. Now that we have built this information here, okay, this, when we talk about a spin, if a uh, spin, one of uh, my comic has asked, what is a spin? So let's say a shell, electrons are in a given, given orbital, so one electron would be up and another electron will face down. Up spin, down spin. Why is that the case? That is for stability. So that because electrons are negatively charged, so one needs to be up and the other one opposite spin so that uh, to minimize their repulsions. That's what we mean by the spin, all right? All right, and so again, now, um, I want us to know about these electrons and uh, how they feel, how electron, um, we have talked about each energy level, and in each energy level, you're going to have particular orbitals in that energy level. If I go back here to this diagram, you see the S orbital, only one orbital is in the first energy level. In the, in the second energy level, you have the orbital S and you have a P orbital. There are P orbitals and I need each one of us to be sure about what we are talking about here. Now, I want to talk about this concept of a subshell here for clarity. A subshell is defined as a group, a group of electrons in an atom all having the same quantum numbers and the same angular momentum quantum numbers. I will not go into the details of these angular momentum quantum numbers. Suffice is to say, those of you who have done um, the simulations, for example, you were faced with these four quantum numbers. So, but what I want to say here is assume, for example, that you, uh, here's the analogy I want to use. Assume you are living in an apartment complex. If you live, you, you're living in an apartment complex with many, uh, many levels, many stories. So what 
that translates to is assume the first, the ground level, the first level can only have one room and only two people can live in that room. So only two. So that is like the first S orbital, only one. The second energy level in an apartment complex, for example, the energy level, the, the second level can have, again, one room plus three other rooms of equal energy. They are on the same level. So remember, an orbital can only be occupied with a maximum of two electrons. So the S orbital has only just one, just one, uh, there's only one S orbital. The P orbitals, there are three of them. So you can see the trend. Orbitals, number of orbitals. If it's the S orbital, it's only one. The P orbital, there are three, three orbitals, which means it will be like this if we were to fill them into boxes. So which means the three orbitals can accommodate a maximum of six electrons because each orbital would accommodate only one, or only two electrons, maximum of, 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 of six. D, you notice we have one, three, five. And so the D orbital are five of them. Can any, anyone see some of these trends here? We are dealing with these odd numbers. How many electrons can a D orbital accommodate? Maximum electrons are in the D orbitals. How many? If an orbital can accommodate a maximum of two, how many electrons can the D orbitals accommodate? Are we together? D orbitals, there are five. D orbitals are five. We're talking about D orbitals. So there are five and each can accommodate a maximum of two, which means the maximum in the D orbital is 10. What about the P orbital? How many, what's the maximum number of electrons the P orbital can accommodate? Maximum, the P orbital. How many P orbitals are there? There are three. So how many electrons? Each can accommodate two, so it will go for a maximum of six. An S orbital is, there's only one. So therefore, logically, the maximum number of electrons in the S orbital is two, 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 All right? So that is important. Now, remember, we started off with a very simple Bohr model and what we are, I'm trying to convey to you is information from quantum mechanics, information from science that has been uh, found to be true in this case, okay? Now we want to talk about orbital filling. There are two ways. In other words, what I want to talk about is filling orbitals one electron at a time. But notice this diagram. On this diagram here, what you see here is are the energy levels. 1s, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then 7. Now, on the one energy level, you only have 1s orbital. On the two, it, the second energy level, you have an s and a p. Remember, there is only one s orbital, and there are two p orbitals, p x, p y, p z. Then on the third energy level, you still have the s orbital, and you have the p orbitals. I, I keep using the word plural, p orbitals, three of them. 
And then you have on the third energy level, you have the D orbitals, five of them. And then on the fourth energy level, as you see here, you have one S orbital, and then you have the P orbitals, and then you have the D orbitals, which are five. And then what will be the logical number of orbitals for the F? How many orbitals do you expect for the F? One, three, five, seven, so the odd numbers. So the F would have five orbitals, and I've been refraining myself from using the word degenerate. They are all of equal energy. So that means the F orbital would have 14 electrons. What you see here on this diagram, this is saying orbitals feel in the following order. You first feel the 1s, those arrows here. You want to see how those arrows go. 1s, and then you come to the 2s, then you go back to the 2p, then 3s, and then you go back to 3p, 4s, and come back to 3d. This is something that I want us to be aware of. Uh, 3d, 4p, 4s, and then you come back here. You go to 4d, 4p, 6s. This is from memory. But really, where it's, this is coming from, I want to show you something so that you... What I've shown you is precisely this, the ordering of orbitals in an atom. Remember, we said we have the shells. Those are one energy level, the second shell, the third shell, the fourth shell, the five shell, they start overlapping with each other. So in the first shell, it only has one S orbital, you can see here. And then the second shell, you have the 2S and the 2P. So this is what I was trying to explain using the room analogy. I try to explain it this way. In an apartment complex, the second energy level has one room in that second energy level there are three other rooms, P, one here, one there, one there, you can see. There are three P orbitals, defined as Px, Py, Pz. There are three of them. They are of equal energy. They are slightly higher energy than the 2s. And then you go to the third energy level, you can see here, you have the 3s, the 3p, three of them, and then a maximum of six electrons, these lines here tell you that there are uh, one dash here means you would have a maximum of six electrons, or of two electrons, one dash, sorry. One dash, two electrons, the other dash, two electrons, the other dash, two. So in the P orbitals, you would have a maximum of six electrons. And then you go to the 3D again, the third energy level, you have five dashes, which means if all of those dashes, all those orbitals are to be filled, or rooms are to be filled, then you would have a maximum of 10. And then you go to the 4S, your 4S, 4P, 4D, and 4F. And 4F, as we say, does seven. Then you go to the five. 5S, five there's only one. 5P, three. And the 5D, there will be five and 5F7, and then G, and so forth. So this is what I've, I'm trying to convey to you this morning. I want to develop this on Friday. And what I want to develop on Friday is filling these electrons into each orbital, one electron at a time. We want to see how you fill these orbitals, how you fill the, the orbitals with electrons, one electron at a time. We'll do this on Friday. So have a good day. This brings us to the end of our lesson today. Do we have any questions? All right, have a good day.